art and nature, two things that go well together. Nature is often the inspiration for art, but also art pieces can enhance the beauty of a natural setting, and both can play a part in supporting the environment and sustainability. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinobrio here in Kampala, Uganda, and with me today, as always, is my colleague in Nigeria. Hi, Niota. Hey, Sandra. Yeah, I really like this subject of nature and the art. The projects that we'll be looking at today were all started before the pandemic. But many of the ideas are especially powerful in this time and inspire us to love and look after our environment. Let's start with a brief look at what's coming up on the show today. A museum in Addis Ababa shows how art and architecture can link up naturally with their surroundings. The new design trend conquering Europe. Natural materials are the key to successful new creations. And music is said to be the language of emotion and it's getting people in Ghana to think environmental protection to heart. Now, in which way can the arts be used to facilitate better understanding of environmental issues? Someone here, Stanley Aneto, has a clear answer to this. The Nigerian art graduate based here in Lagos has decided to use his creative skills to remind humanity to care for the environment. With music, poetry, photography, and paintings, he speaks to the younger generations in a language they can relate to and proves that the art are a powerful medium for conveying the message that Mother Earth needs to be looked after. Let's go see this. Nice one. Lecture. That's a tree, 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 trees. I didn't put any effort drawing the walls and all this. But the trees, 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 trees. Tank. Mwah. Stanley Aneto is an artist on a mission, and paper and paint are not his only weapons in his fight to protect the environment. He's also a singer you really need to listen to. His songs focus on water and drought, the felling of trees, air pollution, and the loss of Africa's animal population. It's a call for others to take responsibility, but not everyone's a fan. The environment, the people, the government, politicians, they're not so much interested in these things because you're actually preaching against their practices sometimes. They are telling them not to use fossil fuels. That's where they make the money from. For Stanley and Ito, spending time in nature drawing is both relaxing and inspiring. But these works are hard to sell. So the artist has come up with new techniques to make his chosen subject a success. The earth and animals sketched with a reflective pen. When it comes to environmental protection, Stanley sets an example his way. Instead of brushes, he uses different colored light bulbs. Light out, and the magic begins. Earth's transition from green and healthy to the alarming state that it's in today, captured through the lens of a camera. Usually, a painting done with oil and acrylic on canvas should take a couple of hours to a few days, depending on the size, and there will be considerable waste. This is done in just a few minutes, and there's no waste. When you use things like oil paint, you still dispose the tube at the end of the day, they all end up in the environment. You know? So this helps us manage our creative tools without impacting in our environment negatively. That's it gives us the appeal that we expect to get from art. This isn't how Stanley Aneto used to work. A graduate of fine and applied arts, he painted like regular artists with oil or acrylic on canvas He's made over 300 pieces using his new method and now sells multiple copies of each piece around the world. The coronavirus pandemic has given the natural world some much needed respite. Stanley Aneto has watched the changes with the amazement. The air quality improved Want amazingly, wonderfully. You watch the news, the air quality has improved. Tremendous. So I think it, it favors the environment. I'm not saying we should get locked down furthermore, but it favors it. It goes to show 
that we are killing ourselves by ourselves. Stanley Anito wants the rest of the world to pay more attention to the environment. He believes in the power of art to bring about change. Right now, I think it's, we have time, we have the opportunity to make a difference. Let's seize it. Let's make the changes so that our children will, will, will be grateful. They will celebrate us for protecting this environment. Stanley Anito will not stop painting and recording new songs. Audiences love his music and it gets a lot of radio and TV airplay. Maybe one day, people won't just listen, they will take action too. Art and culture have always taken much of their inspiration from nature. Certainly painters, poets and singers, but there are even entire people groups whose culture and way of life highlights humankind's dependence on the environment. Sandra? That is right, NT, and that is why we are now off to South Africa, where the indigenous sun people can point to cave paintings of animals and hunters dating back 26,000 years. The sun have a tremendous knowledge of nature and plant life, and they're sharing it with the visitors to the first sun culture center in South Africa. Eco Africa took a tour. Eland antelopes are shy creatures. But Matthias Sibongo knows how to get up close, slowly and steadily, and from downwind. His people, the San, hunt the animals, but today Matthias is only checking up on the herd. Elands have special significance for the San. If you look at the structure of the animal itself, it's quite massive. It can provide a lot of meat, it can provide a lot of at the same time, a blanket. The skin is used as a blanket. And there is also a fat. They use it for cooking. They use it for as a lotion. They use it for cleaning themselves. They, the, the traditional doctors, they use it also for another purposes. Matthias works as a guide at the Kwatusan Culture and Education Center in Eiserfontein, near Cape Town. It's the first center dedicated to San culture in South Africa. The traditional hunters and gatherers are an indigenous people in southern Africa. Their ancestors lived here when the Dutch reached these shores over 300 years ago. The rock art they left behind emphasizes the San's deep connection to nature. The dominance of the European colonialists, massive land loss and assimilation have marginalized the group. Today, there are only about 150,000 people in southern Africa who identify as San. Working at the center, Matthias's colleague, Nunca Kadimo, has learned to appreciate the beliefs and traditions of her people. Whether it's animals, it is plants, it is the way of living, try to learn so that you can keep your culture so that you can live with it one day. So that one day you can tell, I am from that community. Not far from the museum, Matthias continues his trek across the shrubland the South Africans call Feinbos. It's out in nature that he can best illustrate the San's immense knowledge of medicinal plants like conkerbus or cancer bush and wild mint. He explains to the group how an infusion made from the leaves can be used as a remedy to treat a cold, the flu, and a host of other ailments. The guide and his colleagues have been working for years to renaturalize the 900 hectare site, improving conditions for native medicinal plants like wild garlic and wild cannabis around Kwatu. Today, native animal species like zebras, springboks, and leopard tortoises graze on fields that in the 1990s were dominated by wheat monocultures. Matthias and his colleagues have already achieved a lot. His message about the environment is clear. Use it sustainable way. Keep it for the next uh, generation. This is what we want to learn the outside world. Sustainability and environmental protection, a message that has been passed down by the San for generations. 
Well, another way artists can help protect the environment and send a message to others at the same time is by taking trash and turning it into beautiful works of art. That is what Kyoko Mutik does. After growing angry about the extent of pollution in his homeland of Kenya, he decided to repurpose tons of waste metal. He's this week's Doing a Beat. This lion sculpture is made from animal snares once used by poachers in national parks. These works were created by Kenyan artist Kyoko Mutiki. He works with waste from factories. 30 years ago, he started off as a welder. In his spare time, he fashioned artistic objects. One day, an art broker bought them and displayed them in a Nairobi gallery. That's when Mutiki realized he could make a living with his art. His works now fetch up to $10,000 a piece. He also trains younger artists. He says that over the years, he's turned thousands of tons of scrap metal into art. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Very nice. Those lifelike sculptures will inspire people to protect their lions living in the wild. In fact, there could be an idea in there. Maybe if we bring more of the natural world into our homes, we'll have more incentive to take care of it. It turns out there are quite a few designers out there working with that goal in mind. They make everyday objects found in most homes using materials manufactured by our very own Mother Nature. Let's have a look at what some of them have come up with. There's something of the sea in the air. These lampshades are made of dried seaweed stretched over wire frames. And fish scales have been worked into the top of this small table. People think it might smell, but it doesn't, because once it's dry, so it loses all the smell and just look like fish scales. London-based designer Nir Mahiri used sand for his desert storm lamp, red cabbage for the intricate veins of his veggie lights, and seaweed for the marine light lampshade. The native Israeli has been experimenting with natural materials for years. He finds some of his materials at the produce market. I grew up close to the sea in Israel. And I love, like, uh, I love going to the sea as I was a child. And I was trying to experiment in different materials coming from the sea. And seaweed was always something that I think can be interesting to work with. Um, and I just start experimenting and it turns up into doing the lamps. In 2010, Nir Mayiri started his design studio in London's trendy Soho area. He sells his pieces in limited editions to private clients around the world. I think people are more willing today to accept the fact that you can have like lamps or other products made of this kind of material. I think also what's happening in this world is making people understand that we need to start using this kind of material instead of artificial material like plastics. I hope so that this kind of materials can become something very common as other materials that are not very much benefiting the environment. Designers the world over experiment with natural materials. Israeli Dutch designer Erez Nevipana coats his objects with salt deposits from the Dead Sea. He dips stools and other objects into the highly saline content. When it dries, the furniture is encrusted with sparkling salt crystals. Berlin designer Anastasia Koshieva uses birch bark familiar from her native Siberia for her creations. Traditionally, the bark's outer layer is harvested once a year. This way, the trees don't have to be felled and they're left unharmed. Victoria Yakusha from Ukraine draws upon the fabrics of her homeland for her luxury furniture pieces. 
she's been revitalizing and reinterpreting the traditional handicraft techniques. Her furniture line, Stista, is coated with clay. Clay is a traditional material for Ukrainian craft culture and it has um, an important meaning for me as material with uh, living energy, uh, very tactile and uh, warm. To stabilize the clay furniture, the metal frame is wrapped in organic cellulose and flax. That makes the tables and chairs durable and suitable for daily use and recyclable. Living in harmony with nature and a respect for ecological cycles. The sources of creative and sustainable design ideas are by no means exhausted. Yes, that is definitely true, and that is very much what we are about here at Eco Africa, urging all of you to live in ways that are more sustainable. Sometimes it can be helpful to go to places that highlight what we start to lose somewhere that showcases the environment. And I know just the place, Sandra. It's a museum in Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa. The Zoma Museum is a green oasis in the middle of a growing city of concrete and glass. Visitors will discover traditional Ethiopian architecture and a rich array of plant life, all with the aim of learning from nature. The rainy season has started and the Zoma Garden is rejoicing. This lush oasis is a recent addition to Addis Ababa's cultural spaces and the creation of Meskerem and her friend Elias. Here, architecture and nature are celebrated together. These ecological huts, turned into works of art, were built using an ancient construction technique. It's a process where you actually get the subsoil. Uh, you have to dig about half a meter before you get the soil. The only thing you add is water and straw for about a month. And um, it lasts for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's um, thermal control, so in so many ways it's uh, one of the best, I think. Sustainable houses surrounded by a labyrinth of plants, most of which are endemic. A dream come true for Meskerem. The ginger is underneath, but this is what it looks like. Tenadam is often dipped into coffee. And this plant has strong medicinal virtues. In a city where cement towers are growing like mushrooms, the Zoma Museum is a space for humans to breathe and for nature to grow. The city is growing fast, I think, um, not in the right direction. Many of the trees are really dying out. You know, if the air is polluted or even completely poisoned, we're all affected. One way or another, we're all connected through the environment. Reconnecting humans to the environment is precisely the aim of the Zoma School. <laughs> Several times a week, these kindergarten children come out in small groups and take care of the Zoma Garden and its farm. The school is open to all, but only the most privileged can afford the fee of this alternative teaching. The students when this age, they have to learn about the gardens, especially about the foods. It's organic. They can't touch, they can't see, and they can't even taste it. So they know about where it comes from until it's getting to the foods. These facets of the Zona Museum had attracted hundreds of people a day since the grand opening in March 2019, until the coronavirus pandemic began. But the idea of creating artistic green spaces in the city has gained ground. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed asked the museum team to build a huge garden at his residency. The prestige project, called Unity Park, has also become a tourist attraction for Ethiopians and foreigners alike. So listen up, everyone. Announce my big moment. Rap music has traditionally been used to convey a message. So. How about wrapping for the environment? Now, this is what it could sound like. Garbage, garbage everywhere. Why don't people seem to care? That's what we have trash cans for. So let's learn to love our environment more. Hey, okay now, I may not get a record contract, but it's clear that music reaches people. And a couple of musicians in Ghana are convinced that the best way to effect change is to change the way people think. So they wrote some rap lyrics and designed it to stick in people's minds. Ladies and gentlemen, Obiane who to sing, who feel the millicent, Obianko Fakin, Yababe Pragana, Prajene Buya sing, 
you're betting na hwama. Hmm, aha was sent. Look at the environment. Everywhere is rubbish. Mun can't the parliament. Ye hambola office. This is announcement. Got a no my fee. Don't wait for government. Who bet me a A4 chameleon returned to his home village and his farm where he grows bananas, maize and cassava. He's no longer producing music. He says he's more concerned about telling people here about the advantages of farming without pesticides than staying in the music business. This is what I have now. Way back, we used to have a big, big cassava, but because of the soil has been polluted. No, we have lost a lot of nutrients in the Listen, folks, listen. I'm about to rap. I can rap, but I still have a cassava farm. Yeah, what I'm trying to say is I'm a musician, but I also have to do something. I have to feed myself. So I'm doing something small, small to feed myself and my family. But look at this now. With this, how can I grow? How can I farm? I mean, feed my family. The plastic, the rubbish are everywhere. It's polluting the land. It's destroying our fertile land. Let's do something about it. Keep Ghana clean. Efo says it's important to reach out to everyone. He's known for his very direct approach. Open dumping like this has been a call to action for the singer. According to recent studies, Ghana's capital, Accra, generates more than 3,000 metric tons of waste per year. An estimated 60% is collected. During the rainy season, the rubbish gets carried out to sea in the Gulf of Guinea. Bola Beach is one of the most polluted beaches in Accra. When fisherman Patrick Loco throws out his fishing nets after a big downpour, it's not fish he holds in, but all kinds of plastic. Sometimes the trash pushes the net into the rocks, and that's the end of the net. You can't go out there to free it, because it will rip apart. So you need to find money to make a new net. It's really tough. Van Love de Kubola, also known as African Gypsy, has come to see Patrick. He was born in Romania and grew up in Ghana. As a musician and artist, he addresses the problems Ghana faces with tracks like Refuse, Reuse, Recycle. Sound the alarm, it's getting drastic. We're causing harm with plastic. Polluting oceans with oil. Poisoning mountains of soil. Refuse, reuse, recycle. Try and ride your bicycle. These water bodies that we are not taking care of, we are killing the life in there. And what is happening because there's no fish, no frogs, no other creatures in the water, the only thing thriving in this water now are mosquito babies, mosquito lava. And so the environment is becoming more dangerous for us to live in. Van Love de Kubola and Efo Chameleon are reaching out to the country's youth. The two musicians are attending a street academy event at a privately run school for kids living on the street. They aim to influence the way students think about the environment. There's fishermen. They are no more catching fish because the whole sea is full of is full of plastic, and we should stop the the essence using of the rubber. We should, we should reduce the use of rubber. We have to clean our society, make it tidy. So we have to take good care of our country, so that our country will become the most beautiful one in the world. This may have been one of Efo Chameleon's last performances, but he and Van Loof have clearly got their message across. They're trying their best to fight Ghana's pollution problem. Efo Chameleon, as an organic farmer, Van Loof with music. Swimming in plastic, it is past drastic. This no we had a sea for me. Too much weight fabric, it's super tragic. Cause I think I how the ocean be free.
and the best of luck to them. Looks like they're doing a great job there. So on that musical note, it is time for us to wrap up this special edition of Eco Africa on nature and the art. It is a goodbye from me, Sandra Trinobrio, here in Kampala, Uganda. And of course, I'll be looking forward to having your company once again next week. Hey, Sandra, I'm already looking forward to our next show. I hope you all enjoyed our stories today. If you want to know more about the environment and its issues, go to our website or social media pages. And if there's anything you want to share, do drop us a line. You could also use our social media platforms. I'm Neil Taigwe. Bye-bye for now. See you next week.